Okay, fine. So I was talking to Sam last night about how to give a good talk, and he said that it was very important that I not use this font because this font will make it look like I'm using Matthew's slides. So I spent a lot of time, pretty much all of last night, working on that and nothing else. That's, that's pretty much uh, all, I've, all I've done. Uh, I tried that one. I tried that one. I tried that. Okay, fine. I, I settled on that one. <clears throat> the rest of the talk, I, I, I tried giving this talk about four times to myself, and it never clocked in under half an hour. So we're just going to go fast. <laughs> All right. And we'll have a good time. Uh, and I have a timer that I am going to start now, and I won't be as good as I was at dinner. That was an accident. All right. The first thing I'm going to start with. All right. I, I, let me tell you. Um, I teach. Uh, I teach uh, incoming students how to program uh, using music. We have a funny uh, thing that happens at our school where our first class was terrible and everybody knew it. So <laughs> instead of fixing it, we jammed another class in in front, which is intended to uh, show students how wonderful computing can be so that they will survive the rest of our terrible curriculum. Uh, <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, there, there are many different uh, flavors of this. They're, they're domain specific. I teach the music flavor. Uh, and maybe the most important thing I'm going to do here, uh, if this works, is I'm going to play a one minute medley uh, of uh, sounds produced entirely uh, by students uh, in the class. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> The art of music is governed by five constant factors. That's what the students are doing. Thank you. Um, my students, not me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, great, good. I'll, I'll tell them that you. I'll tell them you clapped uh, individually. Okay. Um, it turns out that sound is often a, not a great fit uh, for how does how many people are here are, are would you con consider themselves to be really quite familiar with how to design programs. Just a question. Okay. All right. Fine. Okay. Great. Um, so the challenge here is in fitting uh, sound together with how to design programs. That's where most of the difficulty uh, comes from. Okay. So it, it depends a lot on how you. Oh boy. It depends a lot on how you choose to model sound. There are different models that you can use for sound. The first thing you might come up with works great, uh, and it is a basic algebra for sound where we have some some little sounds. Right? And then we have ways of sticking sounds together. We have uh, ways of putting sounds on top of each other uh, and things like that. All right? And that works fine. Actually, that one, that works really quite well. Uh, here's a really simple example of playing a whole bunch of uh, piano notes uh, all on top of each other. So you can do something like that. That's kind of fun. Um, I, uh, I, you're gonna have to stop me on this one. Here's a nice little world program. Um, the Amen Brother loop was taken, so I had to go with Apache on this one. Yeah, I could spend too long doing that. <laughs> That's a lot like what we heard yesterday, right? Uh, this is like the stuff that um, 
that uh, Sam Aaron is doing, and it's great. But I, that's not what I want to talk about. Okay, that's not good enough. All right, I, I, I actually want to go uh, beyond that because I want to dig deeper uh, into sound, and this is an area that that you might call uh, signal processing. Here, let's see if we can get uh, racket to crash. If so, it'll be my fault. Mm, yeah, thank you very much. All right, <laughs> these things happen, right? Uh, does Sam know that it's not good enough? What? Sam Aaron, you said it's not good enough. Oh, it's not. Oh, I'm sorry. For, forgive me. I, I, okay. Um, it, it, it's what we, he wants to do. It's not quite what I want to do. All right. What I want to do is signal processing. Uh, and so, in order to do that, we've got to dig a little deeper and come up with a different representation uh, for sound. All right, so many of you are probably familiar what representation of sound it is uh, that we're going to be taking a look at. Rather than thinking of sound as being atomic little pieces, we're going to, thanks to all of the wonderful work uh, by Fourier and Nyquist and Shannon, uh, we're going to say, oh, look, uh, we can regard a signal uh, as being made up of a finite, uh, as being a, a discrete sequence of uh, discrete numbers, right? You knew this. And in fact, I'm not even going to bother showing you that. We're going to skip. Uh, we're going to skip that part. The the, the point is that uh, you can easily regard a sound as being a sequence of numbers. But things start to break now. Okay, now we start to be a little bit less happy uh, with how to design programs. All right. So here's a really simple question that you might want to ask: What happens if I, I told you a sound is a bunch of numbers? Right. Let's take all those numbers and negate them. What is the sound going to sound like? All right, so what is the sound going to sound like? The same. It's going to sound exactly the same. That's great. But that's not obvious, right? That's really not obvious at all. So here, I'd, I'd like to write a program like this. This is how to design programs. We know how to do this, right? All we need to have is empty sound, uh, sound cons, empty sound ha, huh, and first sound and rest sound, right? And, and we're done. All right. But there's a problem with this. All right, here's, here's, here's the sequence of numbers. Here, here's the, the problem with this is, all right, you remember that 16.6 .6 milliseconds? Pa, please, 16.6, that's, that's an eternity. We've got 22.7 microseconds, all right? We've got 22.7 microseconds to come up with each sample because although Shannon and Nyquist were nice enough to tell us that we could get away with a discrete sequence of numbers, the bad news is we need a lot of them. All right, we need 44,000 of them every second if you want something that sounds good, right? So 10 seconds of sound, suddenly you're talking about half a million samples. So this piece of code that I showed you with the empty cons and the sound first and sound rest, you're building a continuation that's half a million frames deep. That's kind of a challenge. All right, that's, and, and, but we don't want to, okay, so right, so what do we do about this? Oh, great, yeah. Are we just going to throw the baby out with the bathwater and we're going to say, great, here's a nice thing, it creates a sound and it mutates things. Okay, this is terrible. I refuse to do this to my students. All right, so what's so terrible about this? Let's just review. Um, I mean, you know, how, how should, let me count the ways. Um, the, the, first, the first thing is it's not testable. Loops like this are not testable uh, in a straightforward way because you cannot separate each individual iteration of the loop. There's no termination guarantee, right? It comes with your arbitrary loop thing. And finally, uh, loops are slippery. When you, it's so easy if I have mutations in a loop, I can just reverse the order of them. Right? And then maybe now it fails in some, some weird way. The whole point of how to design, one of the points of how to design for, <laughs> right, is, is to avoid that. So I don't want to go there. All right? The question is, uh, how can we, how can we solve this? Right? Well, uh, there's an obvious answer. <laughs> there's an obvious answer. Uh, the obvious answer is, let's hide the construction, let's hide the mutation, and we'll just make it higher order. All right, now, yeah, I know higher order is always kind of a, that's kind of like our public static void a little bit, you know, when we, when we go higher order with the students. I, I, I've never, I never thought I was going to, I didn't, I don't know why that came out of my mouth. I'm sorry. I, I just thought of that. I shouldn't have said it out loud. <laughs> All right, so here's a nice interface. Uh, here's, a, <laughs> here's a nice interface uh, for you know, converting a function into a sound, and we're going to create a sound that is basically uh, a sine wave. Right? Uh, this is a sine wave at a frequency of 201 hertz. Let's see how it sounds. Uh, 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 
Sounds great, all right? I, 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 um, there's a problem with this, it turns out. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say I wanted to do something that actually went up by an octave. So in order to do that, I have to double the frequency. All right. So by instead of this 201, I'm going to replace this with something that goes from 201 up to twice that. All right. By multiplying 201 times 1 plus frame over 3 times the sample rate. So, so when the frame gets up to three, 3 seconds, this should be 2, and this will go up to 402. Mm -hmm. And now we, we need our note again. Okay. All right. Let's listen to it. Okay. What happened? We, we, no, we went too far. Why, why did it go too high? Why did it go? That's crazy. Why did it go so high? I mean, maybe I have a bug. I don't think I have a bug. I don't have a bug, okay? What I have is, I have, I have math. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to go fast here, and you can take a pencil and check me when I'm done. All right? <laughs> it just so happens that a sine wave right, can be seen as being the real part of, yeah, by the way, we have a little pixelation problem here when I scale. That's okay, let's talk about that later. Uh, a sine can be regarded as the real part of a, of a complex phasor, e to the i omega t. All right, and if we want to know what the frequency of this is, all we have to do is take the derivative of this. Right? Do you know what happens when we take the derivative of something e to the whatever? This, this little guy pops out here. Right? You've done that enough. And in fact, what we really care about is the absolute value of that, which is even more wonderful because this guy is always of magnitude 1. It's gone. i is of magnitude 1. It's gone. All you get back is omega. All right, so what this means is that the uh, frequency of this thing is omega. That's what we heard it the first time. All right, so what happens then when we t take something that starts at omega and gradually goes up, right? We, well, we were hoping that the frequency turns out to be omega plus kT, right? So it'll just pop on down there like it did before. Oh, but it doesn't. All right, so what happens? <laughs> the problem is, and this looks, it looks complicated, but it's really not. The, the problem here is there's a T. There's another T inside that thing, right? Oh, so all of a sudden my chain rule gets all messed up. And this is the part you should do on the way home, on the plane, with a pencil. Look, 2, 2 kT. It doesn't go omega plus kT, it goes omega plus 2 kT. You went twice as high as you meant to. All right, it didn't work. It didn't work. You can't, what you're, this higher order thing that we came up with imagines that we can easily describe a signal as being a mapping from time to value, and we can't. Doing that re requires integrating. Because right? what we're hearing is a derivative. What we want to specify is basically that derivative of every point. And then in order to then calculate the actual signal, you have to integrate over that. That's hard. All right. It turns out, though, there's a really easy way to fix this. Again, Shannon and Nyquist come to the, to the rescue. Because we don't actually care. It, it's easy to compute that thing, or at least approximate it, uh, on the way. All you have to do is figure out how much to change it by each time. Right? and change it. At each sample, you can just say, well, this is what the old state was, and now I'm just going to mutate it and change it to the new state. Oh, crap. I mean, crab. Um, OK, so what's wrong with this? We got the set bang back again. We, we, we were trying to avoid it, and it came back. It came back and bit us. All right, so here's what we want. This is a nice way of describing what we want. You can see what you want. But I don't want the mutation. I want it to be testable, right? I want to say, these are the initial values of these things, and then here's some update rules for them, right? I don't actually want the full power of mutation. I just have a bunch of really simple equations. All right, so here's what I want instead. Look, now I'm happy. So this is, and this is what I, this is what I want you to look hard at, and I'm almost out of time. Tell me what I, how I can do this better. This is, Basically, FRP, okay? So here's what we're doing. We have a special form, nice little macro, that specifies a set of equations, right? And in order to get that feedback, that mutation, we have a special form called previous, all right? So we can say the pitch is equal to the previous pitch plus the pitch increment. Oh, well, what should we start out with? We need an initial value. Okay, so we're gonna just jam that guy in here. This will be the initial value. And then after that, this takes on the value of the previous pitch. 
What we're basically describing here is a graphical syntax in textual form. Each of these nodes has a name. If you, if you think about Elm, right, if you think about other kinds of FRP languages, think about the relationship between these two. Those languages, I think often they have type systems and they, they make signals into just another type of thing. So you write your programs and you're allowed to sort of mix signals and use the combinators. I'm charging you more, in some sense, because I'm requiring you to break them out into clauses. Right? But on the other hand, uh, I get to use it with beginners and I don't have to talk about signal combinators. All right, I have nine seconds left. Uh, and fortunately, I have, I think, one and a half more slides left. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover, and I won't really cover it. Um, you might reasonably ask, can we abstract over this? This thing looks very, very flat, all right? Uh, and the answer is, is yes. Uh, when I use this left arrow, then this thing uh, is actually a signal, right? And these get fed in as the inputs. So I can abstract over signals, and I can connect whole graphs in uh, in this way. Right. Is there a nicer way to do this? I I'm asking you this as a serious question, and, and you can and you can tell me uh, you can tell me afterwards. All right. Uh, it seems to work well. <laughs> it seems to work fairly hard. Uh, fa fairly fairly hard. It seems to work uh, fairly well. All right, so um, I don't think we have time to, this is what it actually expands into. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> I've just given you part one of the three parts of this talk. I'm not gonna give the other two parts. Um, so they have to do with how you put on sound into Big Bang, uh, and Matthias is gonna throw me out of the room if I talk about that, so let's not talk about that. Um, and another serious question that I have uh, has to do with the balance between creative exploration uh, and test cases. How much should we require uh, students to write test cases? Finally, uh, please uh, install it, make it crash, uh, give me bug reports. Thank you very much. So we have time for maybe one question. So when you're saying the last slide, when you had the things lined up in two columns and then seeing how this expands, I mean, it kind of reminds me of a new syntax from Monad, and I'm wondering if state would have pattern. Right. Uh, um, uh, is it a Monad? Well, uh, sorry, that's a very uh, that's a very straightforward question, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm willing not to answer that question uh, um, uh, for now. It may not be important, uh, but I'll think about it. Sure. Yeah. Okay.